So with the housekeeping out of the way, I can do probably what I should have started with and introduce myself. My name is Ed Bennett. I am a research software engineer at Swansea University. And more importantly, I am the program chair for RSECon 23, which we are going to be holding in sunny, lovely Swansea. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm here to try and give you some advice, give you some tips on how to submit a submission to the conference that will be the best that it can be and will stand a good chance of being accepted by our reviewers. Um, I'm joined today by other members of the conference committee who I will um, introduce at appropriate points. Uh, so with that said, let's go to the agenda for today. So we'll start off just reviewing the types of submissions we are soliciting this year. And I will call on uh, two of the um, chairs of those areas to talk about those things. Then we'll talk about some of the fields on the submission form that might require a little bit more thought that are not things like, what is your name? Um, and then talk about a few things you might want to bear in mind while you're preparing your submission. So some things that don't specifically fall in the first two categories, but it's worth mentioning. And then finally, we'll move on to Q&A. Um, incidentally, uh, the right hand side here, you can see a beach. The left hand side is the venue that we are going to be having the conference in this year. So something to bear in mind if you're on the fence about whether you want to come to Swansea. So let's talk about submission types first. So the first group of submission types is talks and panels. And our talks and panels chair, James, is on the call today with us and is available to tell us about these things. Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm James. I'm head of research software engineering at King's College London and obviously importantly here, the talks chair for this year's conference. So within the sort of the talks side of uh, the conference, we have three different formats. So the first format, the simplest and the one of which we expect there to be the most is the simple talks format. This is your broadly traditional academic style talk, uh, 20 minutes, five minutes Q&A. These are really good for one directional information sharing. So you have some information or a story you want to tell to the audience and you share that with the audience. There is some time for the questions, for questions at the end. So you can get a little bit of uh, feedback there, but that's not the focus of this type of session. This format's really good for raising awareness of something you've done, um, whether that's a, a tool you like or, or a project you've worked on recently. Um, and notably, you can get quite good stories from these talks, whether your project was successful or unsuccessful. So there's some really good stories to tell about projects which have failed for some reason as well. Um, and one of the things to think about here is why is your talk relevant to an audience of research software engineers rather than a particular domain. So being a conference of research software engineering, we're slightly different from a, a domain focused conference. We have a, a much broader range of interests there. So trying to keep quite a broad um, audience in mind when you prepare your talk. Next slide, please, Ed. The other two formats under the talks side of the conference are the audience led and the presenter led panels. So these are relatively similar in format. You have a panel that you've assembled. So this would be say sort of three to six people with a range of views, a range of positions on the topic you want to talk about. Audience led panel, 50 minutes very interactive so these are driven by audience questions you can introduce the panelists and maybe set the scene at the beginning but the bulk of this format is about talking about topics that the audience has raised so you can get really diverse and interesting discussions happening here and this is going to happen via slido so that we can support remote attendees just as well as we can support attendees in the room this format's really good for extended discussions about broad topics. 
um, and topics for which you would like to receive some thoughts from the audience. So where talks are about you sharing your thoughts, um, the audience led panels are about receiving information and having longer discussions. At the point of submitting an abstract, you don't need to have a panel assembled. It might be nice if you've got a couple of names in mind or the sort of people you'd like to put on the panel. Um, but don't worry about that if you don't have that yet. And we can we can help you put that together um, if you do need some support with that. Next slide, please, Ed. Um, I feel like Professor Witty. Uh, the third format under this side is the presenter-led panel. So these are, again, 50 minutes. Different from the audience-led panels, these are sort of a, a more traditional panel where they're driven by the chair. So the chair asks questions to the panel um, and we have discussions within the panel. There is some room for Q&A with the audience, but again, as with talks, that's not the focus. It's primarily about sharing the views and opinions of the people in the panel. This is really good for controversial topics. Um, you can have some really good discussions among panelists who have different views on a controversial topic. Um, particularly one where if you had it as an audience panel, people may have very strong views and you might end up sort of going down a rabbit hole um, and, and not managing to address everything that you want to. They're also, and I think the audience led panels are as well, very good for topics which might spark prolonged discussion. Um, so you've got a couple of panelists, people can approach them at lunch to say, hang on, I, th I thought this was really interesting from the panel, can we have a, a discussion about that? And with these ones, it's particularly important to have diverse views um, among the panelists, because you don't want a panel where everyone just agrees with each other, that's not particularly engaging, you want some sort of polite disagreement within the panel. And I think at that point, we will hand over to Chris. Great, thanks for that. Um, cool, so uh, I'm the workshops chair for the conference and a member of the uh, RSE team based at Imperial. Um, and so, yeah, we have a few different sort of more hands-on uh, kind of formats um, as well, in addition to the sort of um, talks and panels. So the, the sort of, Maybe the 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 main one of these is the 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 workshops. Uh, well, this is I you know meant to be much more of a hands on format where people can um, like be taught a new skill, try something out, actually have a go at trying with their their hand at something. And the idea is that they should be able to you know participate, um, follow along on their own laptop that they bring to the session. Um, and so that that implies a bit more around, um, you know, an expectation that people should be, you know, able to, you know, some provision should be made for people to be able to participate and some some thought put into the kind of experience uh, for attendees there. Um, we're offering a 90 or a 180 minutes format. Um, this is based on some of the feedback last year, which kind of wanted more kind of like short introduction-y type workshops where you could sort of really quickly get up, you know, have, get set up with something and, and have a quick go with it, um, but also uh, allowing for some more uh, deeper dive kind of uh, technical longer workshops as well. Um, yeah, and you don't have to be the, you know, the inventor of the tool or the creator of the thing at hand, you know, if, you, if there's just a, something that you're really enthusiastic about and you, uh, you, you, you think the, the wider community would benefit from hearing about it, uh, then, then that's totally great as well. Uh, next slide, please. Awesome. Um, so as well as the workshops, we have uh, walkthroughs. Um, these are quite a bit longer than the normal talk, and you see that they're quite bias towards the Q&A as well. So the Q&A makes up a third of the uh, the total duration. So these aren't envisaged as um, uh, like interactive. So there's no intention that people should follow them along. Um, but it is very much a format where 
you're kind of doing a demonstration you're giving an overview of of something um so maybe you have a tool you know a tool that you're particularly interested in um you know diving into and and showing people how to use um but maybe it's a bit complex to get for them to get set up themselves or something like that um and it kind of generally ends up being made up of like a low combination of maybe some live coding some demoing some slides um, so it's just a bit more kind of mixed up than um, a, a standard talk is expected to be, and you have a bit more time and space to to really get into something. These tend to be on technical topics. Um, they tend to it tend to lend themselves well towards that, but there's no hard or fast rule about that. So if you think you have a non-technical uh, topic that would be suitable for work walkthrough, then um, that's 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 totally fine and can be considered. Uh, and the next slide. Thank you. All. So, in a radical new innovation for 2023, um, we're also trying um, a new hackathon type format. This, in some ways, is a bit similar to a workshop, but the idea is rather than it necessarily primarily being like a teaching exercise where you're trying to, you know, develop, you know, impart a new skill, uh, it's more about a um, bringing people together to sort of try and create something um or, or sort of onboard them into working on a, an open source project or something like this um so again this is intended to be very very hands-on very interactive for people um and it's probably going to be just because of the the the, the time is fairly limited it's 100 uh, still 180 minutes so that's a half day uh of uh, in the workshop format which is still a bit of a, a tough uh time frame to get something um you know get someone like contributing to something so it's kind of well suited to projects that that you know already you know have a well like fairly well defined that um have have been around for a while have you know well established processes for people to contribute maybe how you know have a kind of good battle tested development processes and things that um that, that people can be can be uh, inducted into and brought on brought up for but this is designed to be a you know a great way to give people you know maybe a bit more hands-on insight into tools that they might already be using um and for developers of projects to try and you know give an opportunity to bring in new developers and um uh, and 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 new points of view and perspectives um so yeah again there is a bit more to think about this similarly to the workshops there's a bit more to think about this in terms of people will are expected to be working on their own laptops and and uh, and how you facilitate that process um and stuff is, is something that you'll need to think about and uh, and have things in place so we'll be looking for things like projects having appropriate contrib contributing guidelines in place appropriate development uh, processes um for people to get involved with uh and all that stuff I think that's it for me. Thank you, Chris. So the, the last category uh, is posters. Unfortunately, our posters chair, uh, Richard Williams, isn't available today to talk about these, so it falls to me. Um, but the posters, we have two aspects to. The primary thing is you have the, the poster, which will hang in the poster gallery for people to read throughout the conference. There will be a 30 minute poster session during which you'll be able to stand around your poster and have people come and talk to you about it. But obviously, if people want to approach you and drag you over to talk about your poster some other time, that will also work. Uh, there will also be a two minute lightning talk to present the topic of your poster to the entire conference in case it sparks interest that someone then wants to come and talk to you about it and try and encourage people that they, they want to talk to you. Um, this is uh, a one on one interaction. so. Unlike most of the media, you are you will be talking directly to single people about your poster, um, which give, give, gives a different opportunity. It gives you a different way of sharing information. Um, so it's really good if you want to be able to tailor the, tailor the material you present so to each audience member. Um, if, if you have a topic that won't um, fill a 20 minute talk is quite relatively self-contained and you could do it with a five minute pitch. Uh, or conversely, if it's a re really big topic that um, might not fit at all into a 20 minute talk, you need to pick and choose which bits you present. Um, it also gives the opportunity to collect perspectives of people you have one on one chats with. So if you're trying to survey the community on something, then that might be a good way of doing that. 
And one thing to think about is, yeah, it, it could be you present work that you has applications in lots of different domains. If you're doing something that has applications in physics and in life sciences and in another, another field as well, it would be very difficult to fit all of that into a single talk that all of which would resonate with everyone in the room. Whereas if you have that on a poster, you can ask what the person you're talking to has a background in and then tailor your presentation and your examples into that domain. So those are the formats that we're soliciting submissions for this year. So next thing to talk about is how to approach the submission form itself. Uh, so the first thing is the title. Um, it might seem, seem obvious, but this is going to be the first thing anyone sees about your submission. So it should be, uh, it should communicate enough information to attract people and make them think, hmm, what's that about? I would like to know more about that. Um, conversely, to let people know if they're really not interested in a topic that they don't need to read more about it. Um, it shouldn't be too long. You, it, it doesn't need to be 100 words long. That uh, you can defer to the abstract. And we have some data from last year's conference. The average accepted submission had an 11 word title, and then the standard deviation on that is six words. Um, so there's a graph here of the number of words in the title of accepted talks, uh, sorry, accepted submissions last year. So you can see this is quite, quite tightly packed around that, that mean of 11. So then talking about abstracts, uh, the abstract should give a lot more context. It should uh, provide information to show the submission is interesting to an RSE audience and also interesting to particular RSEs in the audience who can read your abstract and decide, oh yeah, that's what that talk is going to focus on. That's going to be something I'm going to want to see, or that workshop is going to cover those things that I really want to know, that kind of thing. Um, it should give you a rough outline of what you expect to conclude, but if you're presenting work that's not yet complete, then you can be, um, you, you don't have to have your conclusions completely ready at the time of submission. You can come to those conclusions later. And of course, in things like panels, maybe there are no conclusions at all until the, the actual event itself. Uh, so things that reviewers are going to be looking for are how relevant this is to the audience of the conference, uh, how important it is, and how interested, um, how much interest there will be in it. So um, bear those things in mind. So kind of the abstract is doing double duty. You're, you're writing it for the reviewer to review and know what the thing's going to be about. You're also writing it for the audience at the conference to read and know what it's going to be about. Um, and again, we, we have some data from last year, accepted submissions. The average was 198 words with a 55 uh, standard deviation on that. And at the top right, uh, there's a plot you can see there was a 250 word uh, limit. So a lot of people wrote right up to that limit, but there were plenty of accepted submissions with fewer words than that as well. So next up, themes. The submission form asks about themes. Uh, the conference has four themes this year. Uh, the first is working with and as researchers. Uh, the second is open science and open source. Third is working with industry and commercialization. And then the fourth is tooling for research software engineering. So more technical theme there. Um, your submission does not have to match one of these. And we, we will ask the reviewers not to consider whether or not your submission matches a theme when deciding whether to accept or recommend that your, your submission is accepted. Um, but when we're putting the program together, ha having these themes means we'll be able to group things together and prioritize at that point, if there's a too many um, submissions recommended for acceptance, prioritize those that will help us build a balanced program between these four themes. But if your submission, if what you want to talk about doesn't match any of these themes, please do still submit it because it's entirely likely we will accept a lot of submissions that are in none of these themes and will be very good submissions. So the next thing is expertise level. So think about who is going to be able to benefit from your submission? So we're dividing this into three categories, uh, which we borrow shamelessly from the carpentries. Uh, the first is novice, who is a newcomer to an area. They don't have a mental model of it. They don't know the vocabulary. They don't know almost anything yet. You have the practitioner who has some experience, is competent at using tools and techniques, and has some mental model of it, but 
maybe doesn't have the full connections, can't start synthesizing new stuff in that field necessarily. Then you have the expert who is active in the area, understands the tools, techniques, and then how they all relate to each other as a very dense, densely connected mental model of the area. Um, so it might be that your submission is targeted at newcomers and experts will not gain anything from it. It might be that you want to discuss something in real detail and then somebody who's a newcomer will not get as much out of it because things will go over their head. But it might be that you have a submission that everyone can benefit from that, you know, we'll, we'll try and give an overview, give enough context for novices, but also really spark some interesting conversations among experts as well. So that's a thing to think about when you're preparing a submission. Uh, next is the audience. So think about who is going to be interested in a community of research software engineers in what you're going to be presenting. So this is going to be in more detail than the expertise level. This is free text rather than uh, a selection from three. Um, and if anyone's on the fence about whether they are interested or not in your submission after reading the abstract, this should then help them make their decision. So it's like, oh, OK, it's targeting that group. I'm, I was looking for something slightly different because I'm coming from a different perspective. So maybe I won't get as much out of this. Maybe I'll go to another event or Conversely, that's exactly what I thought I was looking for. I am that person. I'm going to be there. Uh, then for certain events, we do also need a technical plan. So for workshops, hackathons and walkthroughs, we need to know what, if any, technologies you're going to be using so that we get an idea what, what it requirements that will impose on people who are going to be going to it. Um, then for workshops and hackathons, conversely, what technology you need your participants to use. Again, that, that, that affects things. But worth saying you don't need to have these set in tablets of stone at the point of submission. If your submission is accepted, we can refine those, uh, but having a, a, a broad picture will help, um, will, 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 will help the reviewers to understand how practical your event's gonna be, what sort of event it's gonna be, how much interest there might be in it. Uh, then if you are submitting a panel, we do ask you to talk about the diversity of it. Research software engineering is a diverse community, and we do ask that your panels uh, represent this, or reflect this in their composition. Um, we don't need you to name your panelists at this point, like Chris has already said. Uh, if you have panelists' names already, if you've already decided that, those can go in, and then the, the panel diversity will be the list of people and a description of how those, those that grouping reflects the community diversity. But conversely, if you don't have anybody named yet, then what will your approach be to making sure that the diversity of the community is reflected? And then we do also ask about accessibility accommodations. So um, if you are someone with a disability or otherwise has specific needs beyond what we would, might assume to be everyone's needs, then let us know, are there barriers that are in the way the, of you delivering your event. So for instance, if writing uh, writing a 250 word abstract isn't well aligned to your skill set, you know, the none of this none of the event types that we're requesting submissions for involve writing walls of text. So if an alternative form of review to looking at the abstract would help you, then please let us know that on the form. Or for delivering the event, if you're if you would need to deliver your event remotely for whatever reason, or if you would benefit, for instance, from a sign language interpreter, if you if you are deaf and would prefer to deliver through the medium of sign language with an interpreter, that we can try and facilitate, or things in that space. I don't know. Obviously, I I myself am not disabled, so I don't have a good view of what accommodations people might request. So if there's anything you think would benefit you in this context, please do let us know there. So finally, moving on to other things to bear in mind. Um, so we will have remote attendees for some of our events. So for talks, panels, walkthroughs, uh, we will be uh, firstly making them available remotely via streaming. We will also be recording them so that people can uh, review them later. Uh, so when you're preparing your submissions, think about whether what you're submitting is going to be remotely accessible as it is it's going to heavily rely on being in the room to benefit from it or are there ways you can adapt it so that somebody watching on a live stream will get the full experience uh, something to highlight we've already discussed this earlier but uh, this isn't a research conference 
So if you just want to talk about your topic of research, um, then it's probably not going to find a very large audience in, at this conference because there's probably not going to be very many people from your discipline there. Um, unless, of course, you are doing research into research software engineering itself, as I know a couple of community members are doing. Um, that there does need to be most likely at least a little bit about your research to understand why your problem is interesting and understand what technical challenges it raises that then leads to you needing to do some interesting research software engineering. But then the remainder of your submission, the remainder of your the thing you present, ideally will focus on the research software aspects, um, the things that are going to be more widely understood among the audience at the conference. And then finally, when you're preparing your submissions, then talking to people is good. So don't, don't necessarily try and sit in an enclosed box and produce a perfect submission um, and emerge, emerge with that days later. Bounce ideas around with people. So it might be that you don't notice some particular area that could be improved of your submission, and then you talk to someone and they find it really obvious. They let you know, and then you can make that tweak and have a much stronger submission because of it. So people you might want to talk to, uh, if you have, if you're working in a team, you have colleagues who you can bounce ideas off, who can say, oh yeah, that 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 would be interesting to me as someone not in your discipline, but you know, as a research option, research software engineer, I would like to go to that. Or even friends, family, partners, they can see, they can they can give you an outsider's perspective of well, whether the abstract is engagingly written, that kind of things. And yeah, if you do want specific advice, do feel free to approach the conference committee. Uh, we're we're happy to give. A, a, some general thoughts, general ideas. We can't pre-review your submission. Um, we will not be reviewing submissions. We will have external reviewers to review submissions, so we can't prejudge what the reviewers will say. But if you want to say, is is this? Do you think this is in scope, or are there areas I could improve in this? Then we can try and give some some, some personal some personal thoughts at least. Okay. That takes us to the end of all of the slides I've prepared, which is exactly 30 minutes, which is slightly less time than I thought it would be. So let's now switch to uh, Q&A. So we have 17 people in the room, and some of you will definitely have some questions. So let's switch over now to Slido, where we can start looking through those. So I'll make that slightly down so we can see that a bit better. Uh, so first question is from Gislain Bayon, who asks, uh, I am indecisive between submitting a walkthrough or a workshop. Could you provide some more details which could guide me through a decision? Feedback from past submissions would be welcome. So workshops and walkthroughs. Chris, do you want to take this or shall I try and think of something? <laughs> um, no, happy Sophie words. I guess I, mean, I think the main difference there, obviously, is, is going to be that level of... Um audience participation right is it something where you really think people would benefit from from that kind of hands-on uh, aspect where they they get something set up you know it, it can be really valuable just to be able to walk, walk away from a workshop with you know a um something set up on your laptop so you're ready to go with it um or something like that um which isn't something you'd necessarily get from a, a walkthrough though you would at least get a recording or, or you know like a demonstration of what those steps might be um generally i think a workshop is probably a bigger commitment than a walk work walk through um so a walk through you'll definitely you know it's just you there talking with a workshop the, i think it's kind of expected that um you know it, there'll be some helpers as long along in the room as well uh, it probably won't just be you trying to help 30 plus people it'll be um you and and some 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 willing helpers who, who you've recruited and things um Yes, those strike me as the main differences. Any others? From there? Yeah, I mean, the th things I, I might think of would be don't be tempted to think of a 90 minute workshop as just a 90 minute walkthrough. It's like, oh, I can't fit my walkthrough in 45 minutes. So let's do a workshop and do run a walkthrough for 90 minutes. That's that's not going to go down well with reviewers um, or with your audience. Um, so if anything, you, you might even fit slightly less content into a 90 minute workshop than into a 45 minute walkthrough because you'll be wanting to keep everyone on the same page and up, up to speed following along with you. Um, the, I guess the other thing to think of is that as, as we alluded to, 
uh, walkthroughs, there will be a recording afterwards. So if you want a resource that people can go back to and revisit later, a walkthrough might be good. A workshop will very much focus on the people in the room at the time. So then that's, yeah, it's those people will get a, a much deeper look, but conversely, the people um, who aren't there will not get that. And they won't be able to, the people in the room won't be able to go revisit the, the recording later either. Does anyone else have anything to say about that decision between work, workshops and walkthroughs? Uh, well, I, was, was, sorry, James, go. I, I was just going to echo that comment that you probably will get through less content in a workshop than a walkthrough workshops because of uh, of the uh, the method of communication and you're working along with everyone else they do tend to actually go slower even though they're twice as long so i will also share in the chat the program from last year's conference um so you can have a look at just in case you don't have it available um uh, so you can have a look at the different things that got submitted as, as talks and walkthroughs and get a feel for that Okay, so let's mark that as done and promote the next question. So Alain asks, for talks, uh, will you be using Slido for the five minute Q&As as well, or is it down to the speakers how they handle the Q&A? Um, we will be using Slido for all, all Q&A at the conference. Um, partially this is because we will have a mix of in-person and remote attendees, and we want both to be able to get a uh, comparable experience. Uh, but also it means that you know the loudest voice in the room doesn't get the uh, doesn't get the rights to uh, ask all of the questions so it, it democratizes the question asking a little bit as well so yeah we will uh, be try and be very consistent about that the guidance we will give to chairs is to make sure that people do stick to slido for q and a's yes so there's a question in the chat from uh uh, from Chen, who cannot access Slido, so couldn't put the question onto Slido. Uh, will there be arrangements to put the content onto a more permanent platform with DOIs? That is a decision we haven't made yet. It is something we were aiming to do with last year's conference, but again, that hasn't happened yet. That is still, uh, hasn't been ruled out for last year's conference and is something we will discuss for this year's conference. And yeah, Chris has now posted the link to the program into the chat. So last year's program into the chat. It's worth saying all the recordings will be published. Uh, I think we used YouTube yes. last yeah, yeah, year. Yeah. Um, it might be a different platform this year because we're employing a dedicated company to do the uh, the recordings and production. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I, I believe that if we put the slides onto a, uh, a platform with DOIs, we'll try and do the same with the recordings as well to keep keep everything together. But yeah, that decision is still open. Does anyone else have questions? I have no idea how many questions to anticipate for this event, so I, I, I allocated an hour and a half just in case the discussion got really uh, excitable. But. I would pro propose, Ed, that perhaps once we stop the recording, we might also ask for questions again then in case anyone doesn't want a uh, question recorded. That's a, that's, a, that's a really good point. Uh, so, yeah, if there are no more questions at this point, then I will stop the recording as soon as I can find the button to do that. Um, and then we can ask again. But, yeah, assuming there are no more questions, thank you very much for coming, everyone, today. I hope that's inspired you to submit some really exciting uh, submissions for this year's conference so that we can have a great event and see you all in Swansea in September. <laughs>